Hey everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Ethics Virtual Town Hall Part Two. Uh, our first session we had back in around the summertime um, and we talked about ethics um, mostly on the county and city level here in Chicago, but we're so excited to have, first of all, our co-sponsors, uh, Elisa Kaplan of Reform for Illinois and Clem Balanoff from Our Revolution Illinois. Thank you for joining us tonight. Reform for Illinois was founded in 1997 by former Senator Paul Simon and Lieutenant Governor Bob Kustra to facilitate bipartisan cooperation on government reform issues. For more than 20 years, RFI has used research and advocacy to empower the public to participate in government, address the role of money in politics, and promote integrity, accountability, and transparency in Illinois' political system. Our Revolution Illinois is one of the largest grassroots progressive organizations, say that three times, in the state and is also the statewide chapter of the national organization, Our Revolution. They are committed to continuing the fight for progressive change here in our home state of Illinois. So welcoming them today to the Good Government Illinois Ethics Part Two Virtual Town Hall. As I admit more people, I'm Maggie O'Keefe with Good Government Illinois, and I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. So everyone is probably used to the Zoom rooms. Uh, you, all, you all are automatically muted to minimize background noise. Um, at the bottom left of your screen, you can turn on or off your video, your choice, your preference. And at the bottom center of your screen is the chat box. You can use that to ask questions during the town hall. We have a lot of questions to get to tonight from everyone that submitted. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna do our best to keep um, best in the limited time available to answer them all. And finally, if your internet connection gets interrupted and you drop off the Zoom, just click on the link again and you'll get you right back in. So the hashtag for tonight's virtual town hall is hashtag goodgovil. I encourage you to take screenshots flattering ones only, please, of our guests, and share your experience on your social media channels. You can find us on Twitter at GoodGovIllinois and on Facebook at facebook.com slash GoodGovernmentIllinois. Make sure you're signed up, finally, on our email list to hear about future events. You can do that on our website, GoodGovernmentIllinois.com, for everybody that's watching on Facebook Live. We're doing this new this time in the new year. So, Please allow me to introduce Good Government Illinois' David Orr. You may know David as a long time, uh, as our longtime Cook County clerk, 49th Ward Alderman, and the vice mayor to the late Harold Washington. But you may not be privy to David's role in various ethic legislations over the years, but lucky for you, I do. Uh, David was the chief sponsor of the first major ethics legislation signed by Mayor Washington in 1987. When he moved to the county, he was instrumental in passing similar laws in the early 90s. He's also traveled the state and got the legislature to pass a law to stop midnight pay raises. That's where counties and cities were passing pay raises after they were elected, but before they were sworn in. So Orr's law required all jurisdictions in the state to not only approve pay raises for polls at least six months before the election. So I am happy now to turn it over to our ethics reformer in chief himself, David Orr. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Oh, Keith, uh, welcome guests, welcome everyone. Um, and that last note about uh, pay raises, uh, anybody who gets involved in ethics legislation, I think the three of you know, uh, is not often very popular with their colleagues. Um, but, uh, so what we're doing, trying to do tonight is take something extremely important like ethics legislation, accountability and government and try and make it interesting. And I know that's a challenge. It's kind of easy if you just talk about Commonwealth Edison or Ed Burke or other things, uh, but to really get to the nuts and bolts of uh, ethics legislation because uh, it's not easy to write, uh, to pass, or to enforce meaningful ethics legislation. And remember when we talk about it, it's not just for the elected officials, we're probably focusing more on it tonight, it's really for all those people within government, probably over 100,000 of them just in Chicago area alone that are affected by various ethics laws. 
And so before we get too cynical about their value, keep in mind that those hundred some thousand people, the city, county, a uh, certain degree to the state, uh, school board, et cetera, uh, you know, they can't take gifts like they used to. There's laws preventing sexual harassment on the job and uh, any kind of uh, discrimination against LGBT, uh, racist behavior, those kinds of things. doesn't make everything perfect. It just gives the ammunition to those officers that want to be good about it. And in some cases, it gives power uh, to prosecutors to go after people that do certain things. Um, in fact, many of these laws, including what's called the SEI, Statement of Economic Interest, which is a state law that many people have to fill out forms for, even though they're weak, uh, that's led to several indictments of people who have not done that. So it's, it's a valuable commodity for prosecutors who might catch people who refuse to follow those rules. So our three very talented guests tonight are, I'm gonna give them brief introductions, okay? Because we have a fuller bio on the screen that uh, you can all see. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, Michelle Smith serving her third term in the 43rd Ward along the lakefront. Um, Michelle was University of uh, Chicago Law uh, School person who then went off to the uh, US Attorney's Office where she did a lot of prosecutorial work. Uh, she's been a strong advocate of ethics very much involved in ethics legislation that uh, she and other council members and the mayor passed through Chicago City Council. Um, Senator L.G. Sims, um, who's representative from the 17th district, uh, that's largely south side of Chicago and some of the south suburbs. Most recently, he's been in the news a lot because he was the key behind criminal justice reform. Um, we could do a whole program on that. And that's really big news in the state of Illinois. Um, besides that, his other fo focuses in recent years have been on equity in public education, on job development, uh, on various police accountability measures. Um, and then finally, but not least, our neighbor, uh, for some of us up here, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Larry Sufferden, who is both a county commissioner and a forest preserve commissioner. If you didn't know that, they serve in both functions. He's also chairman of a very, very important committee, and that is the Legislation and Intergovernmental Relations Committee. He's also the go-to guy for anything that's particularly complicated in the county. Uh, everybody <laughs> tends to go to Larry to try and clarify very complicated things. Uh, so all of these people, I thank you. You're all serious, you're hardworking, uh, you're committed, and you're smart. So having said that, let's go. And to, the, uh, to our friends who listened, we're going to try and weave in your questions. You know, you sent questions. Some of them are a little out of the purview. If we can get to them, we will. But we're trying to weave them in in some ways. So let's start with one of the key issues. And I'll let you all elaborate a little bit more. But let's, we're going to keep it kind of like a talk show, I guess. Um, what are your jurisdictions doing, okay, to prevent the key part of, you know, conflicts of interest? Um, and we're talking most about elected officials, but it's others as well, particularly related to outside income and lobbying. Let's start with that big one. Um, and um, I don't know if there's as much act, frankly, in the state. I know there's stuff in the, well, there's stuff in both the city and county, and there's more stuff being proposed for the county. Uh, did you want to start with that, Michelle, because you were part of some of the activities there? I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to. First of all, thank you so much for having this, this uh, webinar. And uh, thanks for everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, I see some uh, folks I know and folks I don't, and we're, this is a really, really important issue among all the incredibly important issues that are facing our state and our city. So we really faced uh, an historic opportunity uh, with uh, the Lightfoot administration to make some dramatic changes very quickly. And I was very honored. I'm the first ever head of the Ethics and Government Oversight Committee in City Council. So a few of the things that we've done right away, well, right away after years of effort, I suppose, like all good laws, is first of all, we completely empowered our inspector general, something that I and several others have been working on nine years to give, uh, to give uh, the inspector general jurisdiction over all of us, which really has resulted in nothing but really good relations with the inspector general, a, great, a lot of great tools for aldermen, a lot of good advice, and we really think that this is a, a, a very, very important issue. Uh, we also did a lot on outside income 
and primarily on the issue of cross lobbying. We passed a very broad bill prohibiting cross lobbying, which speaking plainly, you know, this whole issue of when people from one form of government lobby someone in another form of government, particularly when they have property tax appeals practices is a real problem. And also things like red light cameras, the things that you read about in the news. So fortunately, based on that concern, we passed a very broad ordinance that specifically for pe pe prohibits people from having outside income that puts them in a conflict of interest with their fiduciary duty as a representative of the city governing, uh, uh, being worried about the city's income. And it's that ordinance that banned property tax attorneys from being able to practice property tax work. It's prohibited, um, right now there's a case in our board of ethics about a criminal defense attorney. Uh, and you know we, we were not entirely definitive about what exactly you couldn't do. And the board of ethics has now interpreted that to mean that a criminal defense attorney can't be a criminal defense attorney. And I'm sure that's gonna go up to the courts. But that has really been a very, very uh, significant factor. And we, um, then we also passed a bill prohibiting lobbying of other jurisdictions. And uh, there was an attempt to beat that back this year. And we, were, and we succeeded as a council in, in refusing that. So I'm very, very proud of those achievements. And I, I hope my colleagues look at this in other jurisdictions. I will say that one area where we are not at the same level as the state and the county, I believe, is in the area of nonprofit lobbyists. We tried to pass a sweeping nonprofit lobbyist bill, and I think we kind of mucked it up. And it still hasn't gone into effect. And, I, and uh, on Wednesday, we're going to introduce a substitute to try to solve some of the problems. So I know that in Springfield, nonprofit lobbying has been regulated for a long time. I'm not sure about Cook County, Larry, you'll have to tell us, but you know, it's, it's a process, it's an iterative process. So those are some of the main things that we've done. I can talk about other things as well, but that's, that's the main thing. And we're very happy with it. Okay, thank you. Um, LG, Larry, you wanna pick it up at all? Sure, I, I'll, I'll go. <clears throat> First, David, thank you for having me and thanks for everybody for, for being here for this very important topic. Uh, I think oftentimes uh, folks look at ethics uh, or in ethics discussions, not as, 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 as kind of, and they look at them as kind of wonky discussions when in reality, it's, it's about trust in government. It's about trust in and having faith in the government that, uh, that we all have. Uh, and faith in our, our elected officials that the behavior is that behavior that they're engaging in is in the best interest of the communities that they serve, not in, not in their best, their own self interest. And I think that's that's the critical point uh, of the discussions of ethics. You know, I, and I, as I was listening to uh, to the alderman, I, you know, I, I I was thinking through you know a number of the changes that have happened uh, in the city of Chicago, but also the the items that we are looking at you know at, at the state level. You know, we, we passed in the in the past in the last General Assembly, uh, the, the Joint Commission on Ethics and Legis uh, Legislative and Ethics Reform, and it was a the the, F the commission got got sidetracked by COVID, uh, just as many of just as many things did. You know, we had a number of legislative measures that we were looking to take up uh, that that got sidetracked. What I, what I have always said in terms of reform, reform discussions, they're, they're, they're journeys, not, dis, not destinations. They have, we have to continue to talk about what the items that we're going to improve because at the, end, the, the goal of reform discussion is to have, a, have a, a, better, a better product, a better government on the other side of it. Uh, so we, we've, been, we've been looking at uh, how, we, how we bring uh, the that we bring standardization across across ethics legislation at all jurisdictions. So whether that's at county levels, what we found uh, the benefit of having that commission was we got to look at a number of these items, and what what we what we also what we found was you know for the for the city and the county there there are registrations and there are active lobbying registrations, but there are other but there are other jurisdictions that have lobbying going on. But there's no there is no regulation of that behavior, 
Uh, so we're trying to make that's why we were we're trying to do the standardization of lobbying pro, uh, or, or lobbying uh, uh, laws at the state level so that we could provide and, and, and put together more standardized program for looking at and having the public understand what who, who and what decisions are being made and how they're being made. Uh, also looking at you know how, how individuals are registered you know, so at, the, at the state level, uh, the Illinois Secretary of State registers all lobbyists. So an individual who, uh, who, who registers and any, they, have to, they, have, they have to identify themselves and any, in, any entities for which they work for, and all of that's searchable on, on, the, on the Secretary of State's website. But again, for the other 101 counties across the state, need, need to make sure that, how, how that, is, that what's going on in those other entities. You know, for instance, we, we, there, there was uh, in DuPage County, Less than twenty, I think there were there were less than two hundred lobbying registrations that have gone on. But to think that that no one is, is engaged in lobbying in DuPage County or in Lake County, that's that's that, that's unrealistic. So to, to be able to standardize those uh, those activities at the state level is, is going to be critical. But also we require at the state level, and David, you mentioned this in your in your opening about the statements of economic interest. Now that is, in my in my opinion, an area where we can do significant work to modernize that uh, and and give the ability for the public to really understand uh, where income is coming from. Uh, you know, I, I I often say to say to say to people that we have a citizen legislature, and the reason why we have a citizen legislature is because you bring those experiences to the to the to your elected position. And you use those real world experiences to help make the make the bodies that we represent better. But those real world experiences, you should, they, they should not be an avenue or springboard for, for you to, to enrich yourself. It should be a, an avenue for you to improve the quality of the community that you serve. And that's 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 what that's that's why we are we are trying to make sure that we shine light on the peddling of influence and how we understand what, how decisions are being made and who's making those decisions. You know, again, tracking political donations, that's, again, it's critical. We want, we want individuals to understand that their government is operating in their best interest. Uh, but that's, and that's why these discussions are, are always evolving. They're always, we're going to continue to make sure that we are doing the things necessary uh, to shine light on, on the behavior and the actions that are going on. Uh, and also making sure that in, inf inf information is available to the general public so they can make a decision about about what's going on. And what what I and let me let me also say this, you know, I, I've served with I've, I've been in the General Assembly since 2012. And I, I've, I know and, and I've, I've served with a number of individuals. I, I know the, the majority of individuals, the vast majority good, hardworking individuals who only want to do right by their communities. Are there bad apples? Absolutely. Are there bad apples who are, who are, uh, who work in corporate America? Absolutely. Are there bad actors who serve in, who serve in not-for-profits? Absolutely. Uh, but what is, what is critical for us is making sure that we make those decisions that let the general public know that their government serves them. And that's what the discussion of ethics is all about. So I'm, I'm looking forward, forward to having to, a really good conversation this evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks, LG. Uh, now, Larry, he's leading the charge at the moment on some major county legislation. Uh, do you want to tell us about that, Larry? Sure. First of all, David, thanks for inviting me to join in this. I want to just point out, by the way, that the first ethics uh, issues that were decided by this country were in the United States Constitution. And most of us didn't know about this clause until Donald Trump, but the emolument uh, clause where we were trying to keep our officials from having ways of it enhancing their, their wealth. Um, you know, I always say that the county is self-government. Nobody is really sure what it is we do. Uh, we don't provide a lot of direct services. We have courts, we have jails, we have uh, a lot of money that we spend. Uh, if we were a state in the union, we would be the 19th largest state in, in the union. And so all the issues that are in any government, we have at the county. And I, I think, David, when you were there, we did a total rewrite of the Lobbyist Act. And uh, I think that our current program has more disclosure and more information than any of the other governments in Illinois. Uh, we're gonna work to redo some of these sections 
Um, I've got a proposal which I introduced in September. Uh, it's basically work that I had done with Professor Sorensen and Ms. Daly and the members of the board, our current Board of Ethics and our prior Board of Ethics. And we, we've held up on doing anything with it because we wanted to see what Springfield was going to do. Um, since we're a subservient government to the state, uh, it's important for us to understand what the state's going to do as they looked at trying to get a uniform lobbying laws and I think a statement of economic interest. As many of you may know, the county has a separate statement of economic interest, which is used as a trick question to disqualify people from the ballot. Over the last 20 years that I've been in office, who took the state form that is available from the State Board of Elections and filed, and it was the wrong economic interest, even though the state form actually is, is, is more comprehensive and they were disqualified as candidates because they didn't have a statement of, of economic interest. So what, what we're looking to do right now is figure out Uh oh, Larry, I think uh -oh. we might have lost you. Oh. lost Larry. He'll come back. <laughs> He'll come back. All right, where to go? Okay, Larry was about to tell us exactly where they are. Uh, he raised several things, and of course, Larry can be helpful in understanding one of the challenges that, Michelle, you've had uh, and LG have. Um, when it comes to outside income, as you say, uh, most technically are part-timers, okay, in office, even if they might big salaries. So... Most places are not saying you don't have the right, the, you, you have the right to make outside income. But the key is you have a, first of all, fiduciary responsibility to city, county, state. And therefore, what they're trying to prevent is, let me take a, a gross thing, okay? We all would agree that if you're a powerful U.S. Senator and you're in a hearing and you find out about something that might shape the markets the next day and you sell off a lot of stuff, that stinks, right? in the same way that an insider information could lead to all sorts of things that it has historically, let's say, in the city of Chicago. Um, so that's what we want to prevent. Uh, no one ever said I couldn't teach for outside income, but the real powerful questions more have to do with how do we stop people from, uh, I, I'll, I'll just go back an example for Ed Burke. Okay, Ed Burke represented American Airlines and I could go on to 20 major 50 major corporations, including Trump Tower. Well, the fiduciary responsibility in this case is to protect the taxpayers of the city of Chicago. So if your client is Trump Tower and their goal, right, is to save as much as they can under property taxes, then you're hiring Burke's law firm because you want to take more money out of the city of Chicago taxpayers. And that's what I think we'd consider kind of a fiduciary responsibility. Um, I'll take it back to you guys while we wait for Larry, Larry to get back on. So um, we can move on from that if we want, though. But uh, and I didn't mention before when I introduced LG, he, he was the chairman. I don't know if you still are of that committee. LG, is that? Okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll just comment that the, your, your comment about inside income, inside information, I'm not sure it's actually illegal in U.S. law right now. And we know that uh, one of the, that, uh, that in that uh, Senate race in Georgia, uh, David Perdue was really, was his name David Perdue? Was really accused of using inside information to, to benefit himself. It's been a long standing problem in Congress. And um, uh, so I, I hope that they've, I hope that they fix their, hope that they fix their, uh, their laws. I will say this, I, I have to say this. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I agree about statewide laws. Now, maybe there is something to be said for it, but I know that the bill that failed in Springfield recently would have preempted our lobbying laws, and I, I certainly didn't like that idea. And I, I hope instead that it goes the other way, uh, because you know we, as David just said, you know the city has lost a lot of money its taxpayers lost a lot of money because the top 10 buildings in Chicago, the largest buildings in Chicago didn't pay their fair share of property taxes. And that really affected the voters. 
And so I want to be able to protect the city's uh, fiduciary position by not letting that happen. I look forward to look, working with people in Springfield and there should be a statewide ethics code. Um, and we certainly don't want to confuse people. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't know about preemption. You know, Chicago is its own, you know, it's responsible for so much of its own budget. And um, so I, I, I look forward to look, looking for talking further about that, that's all. You know, and, 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 and David, I, I'm, uh, I often say I'm trying to, I'm still trying to find the part-time part of, of this job because <laughs> uh, it's certainly, certainly not uh, uh, something that, um, that, that, that you can, you can if, you do the, if you do these jobs right, which I, I find that uh, a lot of my colleagues do, uh, that you are certainly not you know, putting in uh, part-time hours. But now having said that, that goes back to the discussion I was having earlier about uh, the, the statements of economic interest. What, what the general public absolutely abhors is this, this belief that there is self-dealing happening. And that's why when we have to have the statement, the, our statement of economic interest, which and I and I'm, I have I've sponsored this legislation uh, for several times now, where we expand the because right now if, if the statement of economic interest can simply not just say I'm employed here, I'm employed there, I've got investments in this much that that does not that does not give us the ability to understand what a per, what drives a person what makes a per, what drives a person to make decisions if they are if they are not if they are self dealing uh, you, you have to have a have, have to have additional information about what what a person what de what decisions that a person is a person making you know how how the, how are those decisions then determining is there a connection between the legislative action that an individual takes and their outs and their outside uh, fiduciary fiduciary achievements. So what what we what we've got to understand and, and what what we what the general public is cl is calling for, are, is the ability to for us to, for for to to understand that decisions aren't being made in, in individuals' own self interest. I would I would also talk about the fact that a number of a number of laws are on the books too. Uh, currently, so a number of the instances that we have seen, where the individuals, for for instance, former Representative uh, Louis Arroyo, the activity that he engaged in, uh, you know, th those were already, those were already illegal. You know, it's, mm -hmm. soliciting a, a bribe that's that's illegal. Uh, former Senator Martin Sandoval, some of the activities that that he engaged in, they're already illegal. Um, what we, what we, what the what as I talk to constituents of mine and and, uh, and 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 others, what what constituents are looking for is the ability to understand that uh, that that individuals are doing what is in their what is in their best interest and not their own self interest, and that's that's what the public wants to know, and that's what they're looking for from all of us. I, I, can I just say how much I support what Senator Sims is saying? Because I think, first of all, the idea of citizen legislators is been embedded in our American way of life for a very long time. And I, it, it's kind of like, if you really, if you, if you say that people can only be, can't ever, can't have other income, what that says is you have to be very wealthy, in which case you've got dividend income. Mm -hmm. You have to be very wealthy or you have to be such a career politician that you have to do whatever you can to save on to that, to hang on to that job. And I think it's great if we have artists and farmers and druggists and restaurant owners and, and things like that who have a, an income that, that gives them, uh, you know, experience to bring to le their legislating and also says to them that they are not so solely dependent on being in public office that they, you know, will do anything to keep their jobs. So uh, that may not agree with what some people feel, but I think that there are consequences to saying that every legislator can never have outside income because, first of all, it's impossible. True. And yeah. uh, you know, people have investments and things like that. So, but I really support what uh, Senator Sim says about full disclosure of the potential conflicts, the things of your income that could lead you to have a conflict, is a really important part of this. 
Can, can I piggyback yep. on one other thing the alderman said? Yep. <laughs> you know, the, the, it also, in addition to bringing those experiences, it's the different perspectives. You know, when you have a when you have a when you're in a, a discussion about education reform and you're talking to someone who has been in the classroom, that helps. Uh, when you're talking about what's going regulations that are going to impact a small business, and you and you have someone who's run a small business, that helps. When you have when we start when we start talking about changes in the law and you have attorneys in the room, that helps. Uh, those those dis, those different uh, agricultural policy having farmers, having those different perspectives are critical to us having policy that works for everybody. And I, I, she is absolutely right. I, I, that's the, the difference of opinions. If we, are, if we go to a perspective where, and we make the, the elected office only something that the very wealthy can, uh, can attain, we will, we will return to a day where uh, the, uh, our democracy is not one that, that includes everyone but it's only reserved for the for a select few. Or um, I, I didn't plan to get into this, but keep in mind the other side of that coin is, or you have to be able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, about millions of dollars in order to stay in office. And that creates many of the problems uh, that we've had in Illinois. But let me uh, kind of push back now a little bit on uh, a question from Nancy. Nancy mm -hmm. S. <laughs> um, no, but the way she put it was, why have ethics laws been quote ineffectual, um, uh, but you've kind of getting us how much wiggle room there is. Let's talk a little bit more about the SEI and some of the things that have happened. Uh, no offense, but picking on Commissioner Moody. Um, so, so people understand the SEI, Statement of Economic Interest, and certain places like Chicago and Cook, they have laws to try and get at the conflict of interest. Okay, now I don't know if Mr. Moody who was getting a great amount of money from Commonwealth Edison, allegedly, quote, for little work, whether that was ever disclosed in his SEI, okay? Mm -hmm. So one of the key things I think we could all agree upon is the SEI and many of these forms are way too weak. You could drive a truck through them, which is what Nancy's getting at. So part of that challenge is how do we make it tougher? Um, if but, our- but laws, David- Oh, you're back, we, Larry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, David, what we've got to do is figure out how we're enforcing the laws we have. Good. And, you know, it, we've got to have stronger IG participation. In our case, the state's attorney has to be able to, to enforce these as well as the Board of Ethics and doing it in an independent way. I, I think that part of the problem with ethics laws as they develop in the various governments is the enforcement mechanism was always weak. And it wasn't there to hammer people when they violated. And I, I think that uh, that's the one area where we've got to get more enforcement and make sure that inspector generals aren't hampered, make sure state's attorneys are looking at this and make sure the Board of Ethics has the power to impose significant fines. They're not going to put people in jail, Board of Ethics, but they can hurt somebody financially, which should stop other people. And do you believe, because that's a very good point, again, for those who don't follow this every day, so we have our boards of ethics, okay, but we also, in many cases, have IGs, okay, and the board of ethics has certain authority to do certain things, and remember, it's not just geared at bad politicians, it's geared toward employee behavior, and in fact, it's also geared toward efficiencies, and maybe we can talk about that later. But um, both, don't we both, particularly in Chicago and Cook, have pretty good IGs, inspect, inspect, uh, inspector generals, who um, are generally on the case. I know uh, Michelle might want to comment, though, in the city, remember, that's one of the things that uh, I believe you, Lori, and you all did, is to allow, which it hadn't happened before, if I, maybe I'm blaming too much on Ed Burke, but the city council was able to stop Inspector General from investigating aldermen as well the way they should have been. Um, well, well, yeah. I mean, let me say this: I I first became alderman in 2011, and at that time, there was the beginning. There was an Inspector General that had only started in 2007, David Hoffman, if you remember him, and the aldermen decided to create their own Inspector General, and I voted against it because I knew it was a joke, and it was a joke. And 
no good came of it and the guy was nuts, but be that as it may, eventually after nine years, I mean, it takes a long time to get stuff passed uh, because, you know, it's a process. You gotta convince a lot of people. And sometimes it takes a scandal. So we finally passed it. And it has been uh, really great. I mean, uh, quite honestly, one thing that the inspector general has taken on is helping aldermen to do their job. Now that is not what you would think the inspector general is doing, but a lot of the things that trip up a new alderman have nothing to do with crime and have to do with just not knowing how to do things. And if we can be more effective, we're, we're all better. Okay. Um, and the other thing that we don't have that the state does have is financial uh, transparency. You know, the, the state, and you, LG, you can explain it better, but you guys can actually, when you have a, a, a revenue bill or an expense bill, you actually have a body that does a review of it and, and talks about its impact. We just barely have one. We only got that put in in 2016 and it is still not strong enough. So, you know, that's a really important thing too. Uh, it's not just personal ethics, but it's spending the t understanding the impact on the taxpayers of the, the bills that are coming before us. And so those are, that's something that's, that Springfield has had for a long time and it's been a tremendous benefit. But yes, in, you just inspector generals, I think should cover. Okay. Let me, let me go back to, um, to Larry because we lost him for a while. And did you want to follow up on some more of that, Larry? You were talking about the need for certain kinds of enforcement. You mentioned inspector mm -hmm. general. Words of ethics. I didn't want to cut you off. Do you have other things you want to? Well, no, no, see, I, I think that uh, David, just uh, on the issue of, of revenue notes on all of our ordinances, we require that. We've done that mm -hmm. for the last six years, and it, it helps us understand where we're spending, and it also lets us know who has an interest in that spending. Can um, you clarify that for? What do you mean, revenue notes? So, if we have an ordinance that is put in. We, we have to have a note that comes from our fi finance people as to what it's gonna cost the county to implement the ordinance that we're talking about. Or if we have a contract, what the contract's cost will be to the county versus what we believe the good that will benefit the county. And, and that's similar to what happens in Springfield where the, the Senate and the, and the House will get fiscal notes from the various agencies on, on, on their, their bills. But I, I think that, you know, I agree with the, the alderman that the IGs we've had have been great, but they've, they haven't had the authority to really enforce their own findings. I mean, even now under our county one, Pat Blanchard files a quarterly report and he suggests solutions, but they can be rejected. Uh, and then he can refer cases to the U.S. attorney or to the state's attorney. But uh, we, I think we need to be figuring out more how to get a hammer. You, you just talked about somebody who's maybe their, their statement of economic interest was incomplete. Maybe they also didn't file for secondary employment because it, it appears in the situation you were talking about that the, the individual was working a second job since he was being paid by Commonwealth Edison, but we can't find any record of that. Well, it's really kind of impossible to enforce those than to have any meat on the bone when we enforce it. So I, I, I really believe we need to come up with stronger standards. And I think that when LG's commission was meeting that they had a number of areas where they, they were going to make either misdemeanors or felonies for certain misrepresentations that right now maybe go through the cracks. Okay, so it sounds like one thing we can all agree upon is certainly strengthening enforcement whether to giving more power, or maybe that's something the county could do to inspector generals. Um, we also pretty much agree across the board. Um, when you have forms to try and have employees and elected officials disclose potential conflicts of interest, that those th forms need to be, as LG was saying, as clear as possible. Um, I know we've been trying to change one in Springfield for years. So that clearly is something we can agree upon. Uh, let me just jump to some of the other questions. I know I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, 
um, Marie had asked, I'm going back to LG on this one. Uh, I kind of, we kind of covered it, but she, what was the question here? Basically, um, will the joint commission produce a report based on the work uh, from 2020 or will they just pass the legislation? Well, that we, we certainly, that is certainly the intent. Uh, I was as frustrated as anyone about not having, not being able to produce that report. Um, none of us saw COVID coming. Uh, when we, the last meeting that we had of that commission in, in person, uh, I, ne I never would have imagined that was the last time that commission would have convened. Uh, and, when we, and when we came back, came back together, it was trying to get a budget passed for the state of Illinois, cleaning up, passing all of the essential uh, COVID-19 relief package, uh, packages that we had to get done. So it was, it was, none of us, none of us saw, saw this, this thing happening the way it did. Um, we certainly, uh, we want to get, uh, get to ethics reform packet, get in the ethics reform package that's meaningful, that is comprehensive, that's one that does not simply uh, nibble around the edges, but it, but also addresses the, the fundamental concerns that our, the constituents have. And that's making sure that uh, they understand that they have the information no different than what we were just talking about, about the uh, in Springfield, our, our fiscal impact note or our debt impact note or our constructional impact note, ha you know, having data versus anecdote. We, we want to be able to make sure that we are, we, are, we are bringing in and establishing best practices, looking at what's happening around the country uh, from, from everything for conflicts of interest to disclosure of inf disclosure of inf disclosure of those conflicts, uh, what what all those things look like. So, but we certainly, I, I, we want to get we want to get um, the report done. Uh, we have we've worked we're working towards that. But more importantly, I want to get I want to get significant uh, legislation passed that will make a market difference uh, in the trust that that constituents have in their government. So that's that's the most important that's the most important item for us right now. Okay, um, uh, again, a question from John. Uh, do current ethics laws also apply to state political party committee structure? Um, I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, that that would only be if those individuals were elected officials or employees of government. Other, well, in, other... terms of the, in terms of the ethics ordinances, right. absolutely. But remember, we do have an election code that puts limitations on how political action committees can spend money. And, and we, we do have a state board of elections, which can enforce those laws and fines people significantly for, for violations of them. So I, I, I don't want people to think that the state parties just can have this money and just move it around with, without there having somebody watching it. It's just not a, a, through the ethics process. Yeah, and that reminds me um, because ethics gets into campaign finance and other things, the city and county do have laws that uh, limit how much a political candidate or elected official can get from vendors who do business with that unit. Uh, the state, to the best of my knowledge, LG doesn't. I remember when people would be, let's say county board president, want to run for governor, they felt, hey, I got one hand tied behind my back because I can only take $750 or $1,500 from a major vendor, whereas someone running against me for governor can take unlimited funds. Is that something that Springfield would consider that um, that elected officials could not take have a certain threshold? Uh, cities, I believe 1,500, the county now, thanks to Larry, is down to 750. Um, is that something that the city would say, I mean, the state would say, uh, elected officials can only take a certain amount from those businesses that do business with the state government. Well, there are certain there are certainly limits in place right now uh, for limit, limits to campaign contributions right now, and I, that's why I say that, that having discussion about uh, what uh, what the what what our what what our overall changes might be those are certainly something that I would say everybody's open to listening to and open to thinking about that's that's why that's why this process is so is so helpful in having these discussions about recommendations and having those having these discussions about how we're going to to move forward 
I think this, this is critical uh, to having to put in pulling policies in place that uh, that are that that benefit the process. And that's again, that's what, that's what this is. That's what these discussions are all about, making sure that we have a process that, that the general public believes in. So I, I would say I would say that nothing's off the table. LG, would you, do you think that your commission will be reconstituted in the 102nd General Assembly since it was a, a commission of the 101st? We, we've discussed it uh, here in, in, the, in the Senate. We committed, we, as opposed to doing a, uh, a, a, a standing commission, we created a standing committee. So we have a permanent committee uh, on ethics that, uh, that I'm, I'm going to serve on. Uh, in the in the Illinois Senate, I I don't know if the House is going to follow suit. They've not uh, finalized their rules yet. I know that is that's an issue that they're that they're talking about. Uh, but I know from from our perspective, we will continue those discussions in that in that standing committee on on ethics in the Senate. Um, I know there's lots to talk about. Let me just throw this out quickly because uh, uh, one of our um, friends. Uh, uh, Dan has asked about this, and that's, he knows it's a little aside, but he's asking about rank choice voting um, and the connections. His connection would be, well, you know, maybe if they had more diversity in candidates, there might be more engagement with voters. But um, just very quickly, does anybody, um, uh, is anybody know that there's a, a strong push for rank choice voting? I guess this would be in Springfield, although uh, the laws would have to come out of Springfield, although uh, local jurisdictions would have strong opinions on it. Mm -hmm. if you heard anything about LG? I know it's a little beyond the purview, but no, yeah, no, I, I've not heard any anything on any proposals dealing with ranked choice voting. You know, I, I would, uh, I, I would, I would go back to the cut down amendment, uh, the constitutional amendment that 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 cut the size of the of the legislature. Uh, several several years back, as as one of the areas that uh, we, we we've talked about in turn that, that has shown a change in how uh, how government how how representation how representation took uh, took place, and you know, but and for for those who don't know, the cut down amendment said basically you 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 cut the size of the legislature by a third. Uh, there used to be a requirement that each district had members of each political party in it. So there could be two Democrats and one Republican, two Republicans and one Democrat, um, but there there had to be different parties uh, represented by each district, and there 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 was some value to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was, was different uh, different uh, perspectives that were involved, and uh, different individuals who had a, had a seat at the table. Um, now we don't have that. We don't we don't have that ability. Uh, but it's still incumbent, we, you know, and again, that, this is to me, and this goes back to the discussion I keep having about the, the value of, and the efficacy of our, of our politics. Our politics have become so polarized because, because people are, have become cynical about, about our politics. And when, you, when, we, when we, you know, I, I, always, I always, I recount a story that my, my district, you know, as David mentioned in, in, my, in my introduction, my district starts on the south side of the city of Chicago goes down into the southern suburbs and then extends south into rural well in Kankakee County. I was in the southern part of my district once and you know I, I was participating in a parade and I was going along shaking hands and I get to a woman and she looks at me serious as, as could be and she looks in my face and says we're not used to your kind down here. <laughs> this is this was this was this was not 1960. This was this was 2016. Uh, so, and, and at the time I looked there and I was, I, 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 I literally thought she was joking, um, but she was not joking. And it's, it is a byproduct of the polarization of our, of our politics. And, and we've, we've not, we've, we've not fully addressed and dealt with the, 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 the schisms which exist between us. And, you know, there's still these, these extreme divisions. And some of that has been driven by the, the problems that we're talking about here today. And that's why you know I think it's it's important for us to to have these real discussions. We, we may disagree. It's okay if we disagree, but just because we disagree does doesn't mean that I believe you're you're dirty. Doesn't believe I believe you're you're a thief. Doesn't mean I believe that you're that you're that you're a godless, soulless individual. It just means we have a difference of opinion. Uh, but so many times that that's the, that's the way the perspective comes across. That I just not only I disagree with you, I disagree with you, and you're a bad person, and you're a crook. And David, you know, one of the things I, I don't think we're going to get to ranking 
in voting because we're still fighting the battles for mail-in ballots. You know, if you look at what the General Assembly passed when they were down there a week ago, it was kind of extending what they had done for the November election. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> we're so caught up in that process of trying to get more people to vote, figuring out what's on the ballot hasn't had a chance to have a discussion. Fair enough. And there's just, uh, by the way, uh, one of the questions that LG kind of referred to it again, it's a, uh, it's important, but it's a, a little aside. Uh, it was from Cecilia T about um, besides ethics, how can we ensure uh, racism is not, uh, racism is not neglecting our community, et cetera. Uh, and you mentioned a couple of things that, and also some of the things that all of you have been involved in a minority contracting, for example, uh, what you guys recently did, what the city's done, what the county's done, as they increase the amount of, because remember, um, governments spend hundreds of millions of dollars, right? State, local, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars buying products from vendors. And so the push from Harold Washington on up to today is how do we make sure that a certain number of those vendors mm -hmm. have minority partners? So some of that value money as far as going elsewhere. So um, can, you, can, you, can I just chime in on this, which is uh, I'm a big fan of ranked voting, at least in Chicago, because we have runoffs. And uh, it certainly would save a lot of money to have ranked voting to avoid runoffs. But I also have to go back to the very beginning. And of course, David's intimately familiar with this, that up until Harold Washington or after he passed away, there was there, were, there was partisan voting in Chicago. And people say to me, oh, isn't it great that Chicago has nonpartisan elections? I said, no, not really, because it, that law was passed after Harold Washington died in order to try to prevent an African-American mayor from ever being mayor again. Now, time has proven that to be a bad strategy too, but the, the truth is, is that the reason that we have nonpartisan elections was to prevent the rise of the so-called Harold Washington party. So it's really got, it's a despicable, it's a despicable uh, arrangement, uh, a founding. And the same thing is true of our series of having to win by uh, 50 plus one vote. Now, I suppose there's arguments to be made on the other side uh, that if you have ranked voting, one, one uh, ranked voting from a nationwide sort of thing is that you actually might have a chance of having more middle of the road candidates if enough People, you know, right? If Al, if the Ralph Nader voters had been able to say, well, I'll take, you know, Al Gore is my second choice, you know, the plot of American history might have been significantly different. So um, I, I certainly support it. It's a whole nother conversation. It's tied up also with redistricting, which we could have a whole nother panel on. But for, for our purposes, I think giving people that opportunity is, is an ethical and moral thing to do. Okay, and it's, uh, there's a lot of proponents, by the way, uh, across the state uh, looking at that. So um, because we're getting close to the time here, let me uh, throw out to, to all three of you. Just, um, um, you know, we can't cover all this. It's exceedingly complicated. Um, tell us kind of in summary for each of you, what do you think of the, the main things, uh, again, we could do, even if we're repeating ourselves a little bit, the main things that we can do and how people can be helpful in that effort um, so we make sure that the Commonwealth Edisons don't keep happening. We can't stop criminal behavior, but what can we do about the culture or the sense of trust that LG talks about? Um, uh, what, what can we do um, to make things better? In any order. <laughs> Closing arguments. <laughs> You know, I, th I think that we've taken some very significant first steps in, in Chicago. Uh, I will say that one of the things that I think, um, corruption always requires a couple people at least, the corruptor and the corruptee. Um, certain things that aldermen have done in the past couldn't have happened if they didn't have a willing insider in city hall to assist them. Uh, and I think it's really important that we uh, give to our inspector generals anything that we can to, to give them, you know, the power to, to do their jobs. Um, I, I don't know what else other than to say that 
people have to become, it also would help a lot for people to become as educated voters as they possibly can on the issues of potential conflicts of interest. And I think the things that Senator Sims said would be very helpful in that regard. You know, we've, we've somewhat increased the quality of our judges because now we really do care about bar ratings. And I think that we can in, in, in increase the quality of our elected officials by really caring about what their ethical stances are. And, and Dave, David, I, I think we've got to re really enforce the revolving door policy. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Edison situation, there is more than a handful of former legislators who somehow ended up on the payroll, either as employees of Edison or as, as consultants to Edison. And we've got to make sure that that, that can't happen, that there is a period in which you have to be gone from government if, if, if before you could come back and, and do things. And I think that we still don't have that down. Good, okay, revolving door is important. You know, right. I, I think I think that uh, transparency is key. Uh, you know, the, 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 I, I have I have faith, and I, I say this to my constituents all the time. I have faith in in them and their ability to move past the sensational to look at the substantive. And you know, there 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 is a there there is an element to a knee jerk reactions that uh, that that. You know, if, if we if we can have conversations about the reality of, of, an, of a situation that we can get to a reasonable uh, discussion I, 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 I will I, I will talk a, about the cynicism that so many of us have come to see because we believe that every action is somehow every, some every action is somehow critical there's some nefarious behavior and intent behind every action and that's, and that's not always that's not always the case now again are there bad actors absolutely but they're bad actors in every industry and in every situation. But transparency is key. When individuals can trust that decisions are being made in the general public's best interest, they they will trust their their trust their government. That, and that's really what our what our constituents are looking for. They're looking for they're looking for trust. They they want to know that things are happening in their best interest. And that's that's the key. That's the key. You know, when, if, when, when individuals trust their government, they believe in it. And, you know, there, there is, there, there is, there is, uh, when, the, if, now I'm going to go back to criminal justice for a minute. Um, Sir Robert Peel, who was the father of modern day policing, talks about the fact that the public will believe in the officer's ability to police them when they believe in the justification that the officer exists. Now, if the officer is doing the right things, basically it means that the, when the officer is doing the right things, they believe in the, the, that the officer has the ability uh, to, to enforce the law. That's really what the public is looking for. They want to know that the decisions that we're making are, 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 are just, the decisions that, they're make, that we are making are in their best interest and they'll trust and believe in us when they, when they believe that. Okay, and let's let's give the um, the kind of final word there um, from LG because we got, in other words, transparency means as much public information as possible, disclosure. Okay, so we think of campaign finance, we think of anything we can do and conflicts of interest, everything where at least outside income, everything we can think of where there's as much information is shared, because not everything's a conflict of interest. But the more the public can judge to say whether or not they believe uh, the individual is following an ethical standard, et cetera. So um, let me leave it there. I want to thank uh, LG. Thank you, Michelle, Larry, all of you. Um, glad we didn't lose you for too long, Larry. Um, you're all talented, hardworking folks, and we wish you the best. Um, I do want to mention just briefly that um, the week of either the 16th or 18th, we're going to go federal. Um, and Congressman Jan Tchaikovsky will be on talking about where we are since we're all dying to find out what's happening with all these pressing federal issues. How much money are we going to get? Uh, how's the Senate going to actually work out? What's going to happen with impeachment? Uh, so we'll have uh, uh, Jan on board then. Um, uh, if you haven't signed up, make sure you're um, on the list someplace so we can let you know about it. And then Maggie, is there any closing? 
comments? Uh, well, again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight who uh, our special guests, Alderman Michelle Smith, Cook County Commissioner Larry Suffragan and State Senator LG Sims Jr. Y'all are great. Uh, this is such a great conversation. Also, like David said, Jan Chikowski is going to join us in mid-February. But if you want to help us produce more events like this, you can contribute to Good Government Illinois. We are a pack. Uh, you can go to goodgovernmentillinois.com slash donate. So we will see you in mid-February. Be sure to be signed up on our email lists and be in touch anytime at team at goodgovernmentillinois.com. Thanks, everyone. Go get them. <laughs>